Okay, great. Oh, one more person's coming in. All right, that should be it for now. Okay, great. All right. Great. Okay. Um, all right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Heather Kowalski. I'm the executive director of the Bidwell House Museum. I want to thank all of you for being here tonight to learn about the forest stewardship and trail plans on the Bidwell House Museum grounds. Um, just for all of you, so you know, the Bidwell House Museum sits on 192 acres of fields, forests, and trails, and these grounds are open to the public, free of charge, 365 days a year. Management of the forest um, as a wildlife habitat, maintenance of the trails for visitors, and preservation of the landscape is a very important part of our mission. In 2019 and 2020, we worked with a local forester to update our forest stewardship plan, and we will be sharing information about that and plans for new trails tonight. As you can see on the screen, we have an agenda, or well, sorry, can't see it on the screen, but as you were going to see on the screen, we have an agenda. It includes three main speakers. Uh, Rob Hoogs, who's a Monterey resident and president of our board of trustees, will speak first, and he's going to provide an overview of our plans. Uh, next, Tom Ryan, the local service forester for the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation and also a Bidwell board member, will speak about an invasive pest, the emerald ash borer that was recently found in the ash trees on the property. And finally, Peter Tucker, the forester who created our new forest stewardship plan, will discuss the specifics. Uh, the speakers will talk for about 25 minutes, at which point then we'll open it up for discussion and questions. And then at the end of that discussion, Rob Hoogs will speak briefly about trail work that will be happening at the museum this summer, uh, with time after that for a brief discussion. So we hope to keep the meeting to one hour, and we are recording it and plan to post it on our website. While the speakers are speaking, um, please try to keep yourself muted, though you can leave your camera on. And you can ask questions either by typing them into the chat during the presentation um, or putting up your hand, doing the um, hand raise button, um, or you can also turn your mic on at the end um, in, in camera and kind of like wave at me and raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, so now I'm happy to turn it over to Rob Hoogs for the next part. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Heather. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, yes. Okay. Yep. So I'm having a little difficulty with the PowerPoint, so uh, bear with me. I hopefully <laughs> it will work. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to uh, begin the uh, presentation uh, with what's become a tradition at the, at the Bidwell House, which is reading the land acknowledgement from the Stockbridge Muncie community of the Mohican tribe. Uh, it is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to be building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, basically what we're going to talk about uh, tonight, and we really would like your input and, and comments and questions um, uh, about are uh, two uh, issues. One, uh, forestry, uh, both short term to deal with the unfortunate uh, uh, presence of the Emirate ash borer, which uh, uh, Tom is going to talk uh, more about, uh, and then some longer term forest stewardship uh, goals uh, consistent with the forest stewardship plan that uh, uh, Peter Tucker and Adam Brown uh, helped the museum with uh, last year. Uh, and then finally, as Heather mentioned, we'll be talking about uh, some of the new trails that are proposed uh, to be constructed. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, Tom uh, to talk about um, the Emerald Ash Borer. Well, hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I guess just to start off as a state forester, I'm available to help out uh, private landowners uh, within my area with the management of their forest lands. Um, and I've been working with Bidwell House now for 
well over a decade. And um, I'm honored to be also a member of their board. Um, so Bidwell House has actually had quite a history of, of, of forest management and harvesting. Uh, they've done approximately eight uh, timber harvests uh, starting around in, in 1995. And uh, the picture you're looking at right now, unfortunately, is an ash tree that is infested with uh, the emerald ash borer. And so the cutout is uh, of the bark and below that is the larval feeding galleries of the emerald ash borer. And so for folks that know anything about ash trees and tree growth, um, that's within the live tissue of the tree, the cambium, and it effectively girdles the tree in a very quick amount of time. And so if you look around the, that square, you'll see bark that's been exfoliated. And what's happening there is uh, woodpeckers are uh, actively feeding on the larvae. And that's uh, what cued me in uh, to this tree. I actually discovered this um, tree, unfortunately, um, while I was preparing for a mushroom hike um, this past fall. And so within the past year, I've found emerald ash borer throughout town. And unfortunately, it's now widespread uh, through our area. Uh, the emerald ash borer, um, each adult female lays an average of about 60 to 100 uh, eggs on each tree. They can be upwards of 200 eggs. Each of those eggs turns into a, a larvae and they, they do a pretty uh, quick job of unfortunately killing trees. So right now uh, that presents uh, an opportunity uh, for Big Wall House. Uh, Rob, if you go to the next slide, um, what we're gonna see is uh, trees that have been uh, felled from some of the high wind events uh, in Bidwell House from this past year. That's something that we could expect happening with greater frequency with the higher wind events, but then throw in the fact that we now have emerald ash borer on the property uh, will be potentially exacerbated. Um, and so we're at a critical point where we can hopefully take this as an opportunity to be proactive on the management of the property um, again, and, and basically uh, harvest some of this ash while it still has some commercial value. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, <coughs> uh, Rob, you'll see uh, some of the past harvesting pictures that you can, uh, from some of the harvesting that happened in Bidwell. And so the picture on the left is uh, post uh, right after the, the timber harvest. And to be honest, it's, it's unsightly and it's a shock. It's a big change. Uh, when people see that, they often have a very emotional reaction and don't like uh, what they see. Um, and so, you know, part of my role is to try to communicate with folks that, you know, just wait. You know, I know this is unsightly now, but this is not, you know, this is not an awful thing. This is not the end of the world. This forest will heal and, and transform in time. And so if you look at the picture to the right, that's of the same cutting area, um, you know, uh, from 2020. So I guess it's, it's not to underestimate the impacts aesthetically of harvesting, but, but it does have a benefit um, if it's done appropriately. And we can then also use some of this revenue to help maintain the property. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, Rob, harvesting, um, oh, there's a couple more uh, pictures uh, of the recent harvesting, but harvesting alone doesn't necessarily have to be for an economic uh, purpose alone. A lot of the harvesting can actually be used as a tool for habitat management. And what we're finding uh, with folks studying is that you can actually use uh, forest management and timber harvesting as a tool to benefit uh, wildlife species. And in particular, uh, we've documented um, a significant decline in our migratory songbirds. Um, and so if you look at, at this slide, there's actually a story map that was developed by uh, DCR and Audubon showing various locations across the state of locations that you can go to and, and conduct a, a self hike, a self tour. Uh, one of the featured locations uh, is the Bidwell House along with the Monterey Land Trust. Um, and so Rob, if you go to the next slide, um, this is where some of the uh, considerations come into effect 
for birds and, and what their needs are. This is a publication that we put out um, that can help assess what you have for habitat on your property and what steps you can also do to enhance that habitat. Um, Rob, if you go to the next slide. So a lot of looking at the forest is really trying to get a comprehensive look at the structure of it. So you can think of the forest in terms of its, its vertical diversity and structure, um, how much is growing on the ground, how much is at mid-story or you know, head height, and then how much is in the overstory. And so a lot of our forests uh, look like the bottom picture where we basically have a mature canopy with very little undergrowth. And so that is good for some species, but um, not necessarily great for, for uh, a lot of species or ones that are in decline. And so Rob, if you look at the next slide, um, you have different options with your forest. So more or less our forests are from the same origin. They're all roughly a hundred years old from past land use. Um, and you can do small things in the forest to benefit uh, these species uh, in need. Uh, so there's low intensity, um, which is basically uh, looking at creating snags and doing um, different things for um, bringing in some, some vertical diversity into the stand. Um, and then the next slide, Rob, you've got uh, increasing, uh, uh, increasing treatments that you can do that are uh, at degrees of intensity. And so there's moderate, um, moderate work that can be done, which would be a little bit more intense. And then the next slide shows um, an actual clear cut. And that's about as extreme as you can get for a treatment. And that's quite extreme, um, but is actually some of the most needed habitat in our state. Um, and so if you look at the Monterey um, Land Trust property, the Mount Hunger um, property. They've recently done work of this nature. It's featured in that uh, Forest for the Birds uh, story map that's, that's on that link. And you can see the effects um, that have been out there. I've been out there to experience the spring uh, migration. The amount of birds in that space is, is really truly amazing. Um, so uh, next slide, please. I'm trying to keep my talk to be five minutes or less. Um, but uh, so I guess the, the message here is that uh, we're going to be embarking on um, some harvesting at Bidwell House. And we really want to have this opportunity to reach out to members of the community so that they can have an understanding of, of why we're doing this and where we're coming from. Um, and part of that process that I've been able to help them with is to give them funding to develop what's called the forest stewardship plan or a forest management plan. And uh, this is a comprehensive uh, document that was prepared by Peter Tucker and Adam Brown. And so they were boots on the ground, went over the entire property and really took a, a hard look at the property and, and really incorporated uh, the habitat uh, from the bird standpoint and then also from a timber standpoint um, basically all encompassing of the forest uh, as a whole for Bidwell House. And they really crafted a, um, a wonderful management plan that, that we're going to be following. And, and I think um, if anybody else in this feed, I actually don't know homes here, but um, if anybody has land that they are interested in doing um, some work or just developing a better understanding of their properties, I am available to assist them. I'm going to pass this uh, on to Peter Tucker and Adam Brown, and they can talk um, in more detail about the nitty gritty of the forest management plan for, for Bidwell House. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to start out here. Um, hi, folks. My name is Adam Brown. Um, I live in Sandusfield, but not too far from the Bidwell House in Monterey, just a few miles to the south. Um, I'm a forester in training. I work uh, with Peter um, doing these sorts of projects uh, throughout the county. Um, and I'm just going to briefly outline the process um, that we go through to create a forest stewardship plan for a property like the Bidwell House. Um, it begins with the landowner articulating their goals. And in the case of the museum, the goals of highest importance are to enhance the quality and quantity of timber products, promote biological diversity, enhance habitat for birds and small animals and large animals, 
uh, improve recreational trail access, preserve and improve scenic beauty, uh, and protect unique special cultural areas. And um, so once those goals are finalized and um, the consulting foresters begin the field data collection, this is basically the underpinning of the entire plan. As Tom said, uh, it guides um, all the narrative descriptions and the management recommendations that come in the plan and make up the bulk of it. Um, so that process is, has a few steps. Um, first, uh, we identify and um, visit randomly positioned and equally spaced plots throughout the property. There is approximately um, 65 of those plots that we created for this project, um, about one every three acres or so, um, covering the entire 190 some odd acres. Um, at each plot, all the trees uh, within a certain distance uh, from the plot center are um, identified by species. They're measured for di by diameter. Um, we assess them for products that are available in the tree, um, for uh, health concerns. Um, if it's, it has a cavity in it, we assess it for wildlife value. Um, and so this basically covers the overstory, which is above 30 feet in the forest. Uh, and then we also um, perform an assessment of the mid story, which is from five feet above the ground to 30 feet and the understory, which is from ground level up to five feet. Um, and we assess vegetation type, uh, quality, density. Uh, we note any resiliency issues or health issues um, such as the base of plants or insect pests or diseases. Um, we assess ground conditions such as moisture and slope, um, topography, et cetera. Um, and then we use the plot information to inform us about the quality of habitat uh, for various wildlife species that might be using the property. Um, in the case of the Bidwell House Museum, um, you know, we assessed songbirds, we looked for potential habitat for New England cottontail rabbit, uh, porcupines, rough grouse. Um, and then once we have kind of honed in on those species, we start thinking about what management actions could be undertaken to uh, enhance and promote uh, habitat for those species. And then finally, um, we create maps that uh, delineate the forest into certain types or stands, depending on the species present. And we show interesting features in the landscape, such as um, legacy trees, which are large trees of interest, like the champion oak on this property. It's one of a few um, unique natural or cultural features on the property, trails, woods, roads, etc. Um, so this is just a quick explanation of what's, uh, how we generate a stewardship plan. It's more in depth than that, but that's kind of a broad brush um, um, Cliff Notes version. So I'll turn it over to Peter now, and he's going to do um, a little more uh, in depth explanation of some things involved in this plan. Thank you. Hi, folks. I'm Peter Tucker. Uh, I'm not Stacy. That's uh, one of my children's computers I'm on, if you're looking at the name. Uh, I live in Alford and I've been doing consulting forestry for, for many decades. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be working on the Bidwell House Museum. It's, it's quite an honor. A lot of, a lot of uh, marvelous folks um, have had their hand in, uh, in helping out and, and, uh, and keeping, that, keeping that beautiful property preserved. And uh, it's been an honor for Adam, Adam and I to work on. So I'll talk mainly about the short forestry management program, uh, program practices that we have planned. Uh, right now, it's definitely been being driven by the need to consider the ash, which are, are going to be dying. There are already, uh, already signs of infest, infestation. Um, so in the short term, we're, we're concerned about harvesting the ash. It's concentrated near the museum grounds and the entrance, uh, especially what we've called stands 13 and 14, um, roughly circled on, on the map and highlighted. Um, there, unfortunately, that area is, it's the most visible area on the property. It is the most heavily trailed prop, uh, area. A lot of the, uh, the shorter trails, the uh, interest that around some of the unique features, the old agricultural areas, that beautiful network of stone walls uh, is there. Uh, next slide, please, Rob. So stand 14 uh, highlighted here has the highest density of ash trees. It's the most visible from Art School Road as you come up and enter the, uh, what I call the driveway, the approach to the museum. 
uh, I, I believe it's still uh, considered town road. But as you come in and approach the, draw, the uh, Bidwell house, all that area to the left of the road as you're driving in is in this area of concern, stand 14. Uh, next, please. So there's some ash scattered in this wider area, um, stands eight and nine, which are off to the south and to the northwest. Um, not quite as concentrated, but still uh, enough to be of, uh, available for, from a commercial logging aspect and still in concern of concern with uh, trail safety and holding some potential uh, revenue as well. Uh, next. So again, most many of the trails, uh, particularly the shorter loops that visitors would enjoy uh, are in this area. I won't dwell on that more. Next, please. Uh, final decision of, uh, excuse me, of where to harvest um, is, is going to be based on a more intensive look and a more intensive, a more extensive talk um, with the directors uh, and with any with with the help of the input of folks like you tonight uh, as well. Uh, some of the trees are, are going to be uh, or some the ash trees are going to be harvested, but there'll be other trees uh, that are taken. Uh, because they're either of poor quality, uh, low value, or simply to open up a small gap in the canopy to complete that opening of the gap by taking one or two trees of another species uh, to make it a, essentially an improvement practice. Next, please. So the scope, excuse me, just lost my, my thought, train of thought here. Um, not only at the harvest of the ash and a small amount of the other species, uh, but we're looking also to uh, either now or in a separate project, clear some areas for early successional habitat for bird, particularly songbird, other wildlife species, um, particularly the New England cottontail rabbit is uh, a species that almost hit the uh, endangered species listing, except for the, for the uh, quick and uh, intense uh, treatment it got from uh, wildlife professionals and landowners who were willing to enter into habitat restoration projects. Um, New England cottontail requires patches of young forests that are generally at least 10 acres in size uh, in order for them to thrive and to have the, the cover, the protective cover they need to thrive. So they are, uh, that's one big example. They occur in the, in the locality and there's funding available uh, through federal sources and through mass, sometimes mass wildlife uh, grants to uh, encourage habitat enhancement work, particularly for New England, but it fortuitously um, the same habitat is is a benefit for not only a, a wide variety, variety of songbirds, but also other um, other mammals as well. Invasive plant control is another item uh, that should go hand in hand with uh, with cuttings. Luckily, there's not uh, a heavy uh, uh, population of invasive plants. I think uh, in Japanese barberry in particular is scattered. Uh, and I think I've only identified maybe 15, 20 acres or so that could use treatment. And it's most easy to treat invasive plants when they are, uh, are sparse or lightly populating the forest and before they uh, develop a much, you know, seed and spread uh, a great deal more. Um, clearing some vistas, vista corridors uh, is definitely uh, an objective that Bidwell House uh, has. And this, uh, 
and right, yeah, Rob's got his cursor over some possibilities. And again, these will all be uh, uh, looked at when, more closely on the ground, but they can serve as small patches of, of uh, young forest habitat as well as uh, vista improvements. So the schedule for the work and particularly for this um, for this ash ash tree harvest, um, most likely during dry months, only because our winters are relatively undependable. If we could get weather like we have today for about two months straight, um, we'd have optimum logging weather, but we simply don't get that very much. We get warmer weather, uh, warmer winters because of our climate changing um, and poor in sloppier ground conditions. So we often have to rely on, on dry times of the year. So the earliest I think that we could anticipate anything happening would be late this year, um, late summer, fall, uh, but maybe more likely into 2022. The actual work is probably uh, a couple of months uh, of logging, uh, depends on what we take on in terms of other for instance, if we do other habitat cutting in conjunction or whether we just separate that and call that a different project for later down the road. Um, so the big, the hard part is we often get uh, interrupted by poor weather once we do get started. So a two month project ends up taking uh, one month now and then one month in the summer, uh, which, is, uh, which can be awkward. Uh, do we have another slide or am I at the end? Okay, operational issues. Uh, skitter, uh, skid trails, we need trails to remove the logs, get them out to uh, a roadside area where a truck can load. Um, several of those are already existing from the logging that happened 10 years ago. Uh, the log landings themselves are there, are at least two if not three uh, ones that would be useful for this uh, imminent um, ash harvest um, are in place. Cleanup after the logging's done, um, as we could see in, in a couple of the earlier pictures, Tom was talking about how, you know, kind of horrible, if you will, or, or upsetting uh, the forest looks if there's a heavy cutting. Um, that won't be exactly the case in the ash removal. It's not that heavy. It would be the case if we did an early successional, you know, a habitat cutting. Um, but there still is uh, slash generated. Slash is the, the unusable parts of the tree, mainly the limbs uh, that usually don't leave the forest. That's not an environmental concern because it's a great habitat uh, element. A lot of uh, amphibians uh, breed under rotting logs. Rough grouse use a certain size of log to do their courtship display in the spring, their drumming. Um, so it is in the short run, it is an aesthetic concern. People generally just don't like the looks of that much woody debris on the ground. Uh, but the other piece that, that we do, other than cutting it close to the ground so it decays more quickly and you can see over it immediately, um, is encourage the, the use, the, the good utilization. So in other words, some, some loggers will want to take only the, the part of the tree, the straight log that's usable for lumber. Um, many loggers will take some firewood. Uh, so particularly with the, in those areas that are closer to the roads, uh, we can make it a condition that there's a little bit more cleanup and a little bit more utilization done. So those are at least a couple of things um, right during and immediately after. And then cleanup of the landings, the log landings themselves. There's oftentimes debris left at a log landing. Again, it's not environmentally harmful. It's probably a good thing uh, from a wildlife perspective. Uh, but it doesn't look as, as, as nice as if it were cleaned up, smoothed, and possibly even uh, seeded to a grass or, or herbaceous mixture that's beneficial to wildlife as well. And I think my time should be up. Great. 
All right, thank you everyone. Um, thank you, Rob and Adam and Tom and Peter. Um, so I just wanted to see, I don't have any questions in the chat yet. Um, does anybody wanna hit their hand raise button? Um, Laura, I see your hands up, but I'm not sure if it's just to say hi to Tom. I don't know if you're there. Um, if anybody does have a question and wants to ask, um, you're welcome to turn your camera on. Uh, you can send something in the chat. Um, so uh, uh, this is Rob. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, thank uh, you know Tom, Peter, and Adam uh, for the presentation. And uh, as 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 many of us know, uh, the last uh, logging that we did uh, ten years ago or so, uh, 2012, 2011, 2012, um, we didn't do a very good job, very honestly, of communicating. Um, you know, we went through all the proper procedures, but it was a real shock, I think, to frankly, to uh, to many of us on the board, myself included, when we saw what it looked like. Um, and that was a very heavy cut up along the Royal Hemlock Road. Uh, so we really want to do two things. One is make sure we get information out to uh, to everybody. I mean, certainly neighbors, neighborhood that walk the, the trails, but to the broader community. And we really want your your input, your questions, your criticisms, if, if, if that's, if, 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 you know, we really solicit that. We want to hear <laughs> and make sure that we do, as we plan, as we go forward with the planning of, of the, of the forest cutting um, plan, which unfortunately, because of the Emerald Ash Borer is, is, uh, is something that's happening sooner than we had hoped, but it is a reality. Um, so uh, um, we would very much like to get your your input. So right now there's oh, so we have two questions in the chat. Um, so one the first one from Zachary Rissman. Do any forestry practices that you utilize emphasize carbon sequestration? Do Peter, Adam, Tom, do you guys know anything about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I can take a stab at it. And Peter, do you want to also have input on this? Go ahead. If there's anything I can pick up, I will. But in the interest of time, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the, the the first two things that I thought of in terms of carbon uh, sequestration is that uh, many of the ash trees that are going to be uh, effectively harvested from a salvage standpoint will be turned into uh, long-term durable goods that we use every day. And so by, by, the, by saving them um, for our use, they will be uh, their carbon itself will be, you know, stored and, and utilized by us um, in our in our daily lives. But then also good forest management, when done properly, will take out um, and focus on removing trees that are of poor quality, poor form, poor health, and effectively not growing very rapidly in favor of those uh, trees that are actually going to be uh, better able and to occupy the site and, and to uh, sequester carbon at a, at a more rapid pace. Um, so good forest management, one done well, uh, does actually uh, enhance uh, carbon sequestration. Anything you wanna to add to that, Peter? Uh, uh, two things come to mind. Um, as you say, good forest management, yes. And that good forest management, because it, usually is uh, looking at keeping the thriftiest dominant trees uh, growing and they're great at sequestering and storing long-term storage. Um, sequestered, as, as I understand it uh, from people who know much more about carbon sequestration and storage than I do, um, relatively young forests do a great job at sequestering. In other words, the rate at which they sequester. Um, older forests probably have more carbon in storage, um, but both of those things point to good things. So um, if, if, if we clear an area uh, or heavily cut a spot for the, particularly for the purpose of habitat cutting, um, that spot not only has its products uh, 
continue to store those, those, those tree products get used in durable goods, as, as you mentioned, Tom. So it's continuing to store carbon after the fact. Uh, but as the forest quickly regrows, then it becomes a, a fast sequesterer of carbon uh, again. And then as it grows larger and older, it is storing all the time. Um, so I think that's the only point I should make on, on, on that. Yeah. Great. And then uh, I do see, uh, I'll stick with the ash. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry to uh, bump over you, uh, Julie, but um, Peter Gorelish was wondering why uh, we would actually be moving ash from the site because he, he thought it wouldn't, it's not supposed to be transported. Um, so ash is a, a quarantine material, uh, can now be moved outside of the quarantine. But right now, the spread of this emerald ash borer has been so broad that we're all kind of living within uh, the quarantine area now. So there is free movement within the quarantine. So the ash can be moved now. Um, I'm not sure of, I'm not really aware of much for restrictions on that. Great. And, and then, then it looks uh, like there's David, two more ash questions, Tom. <laughs> yeah, okay. And so David was wondering if the if the forest will look devastated. And I guess I'd have to say that kind of is a beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or devastation is also in the eye of the beholder. So, um, you know, the, the ash harvested are, you know, it will be noticeable, um, them not being there. Um, and I guess... It's hard to, you know, because it's it's really a more of a, a personal preference. But I guess I can say, you know, David, when you look out the property that I know you live on, and you're actually looking over uh, the Bidwell House property, and that part of the forest that you've uh, come to appreciate um, has been harvested multiple times within the past uh, 15 years. So there's been, I think, at least three or four entries into that section uh, for for various harvesting over the years. So if you like the looks of the forest that you're looking at now, um, that's what you think you can expect um, in the areas that we're gonna be treating um, as well. And then Rob, I think you can answer Julie's uh, question about where the orchard is gonna be sited. Okay. Um... Yeah, I'm, let's see. yeah, so it's the like the second question. She uh, wanted to know where the orchard area was that we were hoping to restore. Um, yeah, so I, I can't bring the map up, but if you're in if you're in the parking lot uh, and looking across the mowed uh, meadow uh, south of the house, uh, you're looking west uh, across. Uh, there's a section of woods. Uh, areas that actually the meeting house trail goes through. And maybe I can show you when we get to the, uh, uh, the trail map, I'll, I'll try to point it out. Uh, but that was an old orchard uh, that has now been grown uh, completely in, 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 in encased within the woods. And as part of this, we would like, there are uh, quite a few ash trees in that particular area. And we would like to open that area back up again uh, and allow that orchard to uh, be expressed. And it's really part of the historical heritage of the, of the property. So I, we don't expect them. Actually, the, the trees produce some pretty good apples. Usually when I lead a walk in the fall, I always go over to those trees and people are surprised and they're very quite edible. Um, but uh, it's, it's not gonna be a wonderful orchard, but there are these large old ap uh, apple trees in the woods. So it's kind of an interesting thing. I'll, I'll try to show that when we get to the trail map. Yeah. And there's then, one more, uh, yeah, Tom, question. yeah, I was gonna tell there's one more about the ash. Yeah. All right, so Ron, uh, Ronald Winters, um, you were wondering if the issue is the bore or the need for forest management and what about the woodpeckers and their uh, population? So the the need for the management is the fact that the, the ash, um, once it's infested by the emerald ash borer dies quickly. And so it does create a hazard, uh, you know, being near trails and being near infrastructure uh, of the museum and the roads. And so that's probably the biggest concern and the, and the need for the forest management. Um, and then in terms of the woodpeckers, uh, they definitely are enjoying feeding on, on a lot of these uh, larvae from the emerald ash borer, but 
but there are um, many, many native uh, insects that are widely distributed um, that the woodpeckers have actually coexisted with and uh, co-evolved with so that they, like their food source is not gonna be um, jeopardized by, you know, doing this work uh, for the emerald ash borer. And frankly, there's, there's a lot of our forest that is not proactively managed. So all of the ash out there uh, will, will continue to decline um, with the presence of the emerald ash borer. And I guess to also put some perspective on this, um, a lot of the reports that we've been seeing across the country that in places that have had the emerald ash borer for much longer um, than we have, um, when they got the first uh, infestations, they're seeing um, upwards of 100% ash mortality of all trees over you know one inch in diameter. Um, so it's pretty devastating, and it's it's sad in the sense that we're effectively um, witnessing uh, you know the, the loss of a species um, like we did in theory, or like we did sort of recently with the chestnut and the uh, elm trees. Um, so hopefully, you know, we'll be able to, in the long term, figure out ways of, of dealing with that. But right now, there's, there's been uh, no, um, no real uh, effective means at controlling the tree. If you do have uh, a tree in your yard that is an ash tree that you want to save, you can uh, do a stem injection of an insecticide and, and that will maintain the tree for uh, two years. And if you treat it every two years, you can, you can keep a tree um, going, uh, but it's, it's a very costly thing. It's not something that's practical uh, in a forest setting. So. Hey. All right, thank you so much, Tom. Um, seems to be all the questions we have in the chat. Um, we can certainly move on to the trails and then if people come up with any other questions, please put them in the chat and we can talk about them at the end. I have a question, Heather. Uh, Heather? Yeah. Um, I don't know how to send the chat. I've written down the chat. But mm -hmm. anyway, I noticed that one of the, the, the drag trails where they drag trees out seems to go right along the um, post road section that we've um, that's there that we look at and there isn't a trail there yet. And I wonder if by dragging along there, they're gonna disrupt the evidence, the existing evidence of the post road um, or would it be s separate from it and maybe the, then the route of a trail or something? Uh, Rob, um, do you know the answer to yeah, that? Yeah, so I, uh, I'll, you know, let me uh, uh, try to answer. Thank you, uh, Delight. Um, yeah, I, again, we haven't made any decisions on exactly, but the, the evidence that we actually see along the uh, post road, I think is actually evidence from previous uh, logging and, and oh. not, uh, not historical. There are actually a bunch of ash trees that have fallen down across the post road, yeah. uh, which have prevented us from using that trail. So we need to get them out. So one of the options that we are considering um, is using a section of the old post road for a skitter trail, but also opening that up. So you can see that it was an old road. So uh, that's one of the questions that we haven't answered yet, but we're, we're thinking about. So it is, we certainly do not want to disturb any of the stone walls, um, uh, you know, as, as best we can try to preserve all the old historic artifacts. So. so so, the ruts that I fantasize about are actually modern. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I Usually when I lead that, that hike, uh, I, I show those ruts and ask people to imagine those ruts as being <laughs> from wagons. But, but in That's reality, they're, they're much broader, they're much wider than, than the wagon wheels uh, would have been. And I think it was probably used for, for logging. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we, that's a good, good point, a good question. Um, are there any other questions before I move on briefly to trails? So I had to say, uh, I forgot to say hi to Laura Dooley. Uh, she's a service forester just like me, and she's uh, chimed in from the northeastern part of the state. Uh, <laughs> she's all the way on the other end of the state. Thank you for joining us today, Laura. <laughs> 
Great. Um, so I'm going to move on uh, quickly to the trails. And just as the first part of it, I'm going to show you on this map. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the, this map is rotated 90 degrees from the previous maps that we looked at. But here's Carrington Patel Road, the driveway that comes in, parking, the field, and the old apple orchard is in right in this area here where I'm circling. Uh, and it's fairly close to what uh, the cellar hole that was, we believe, where Reverend Bidwell had his first house before he built the, the larger house up on the hill. Um, this map uh, shows the, uh, the existing trail network, uh, which, by the way, we're delighted that so many people are using uh, very actively. We've probably had more people walking the trails this year than, than we ever have. Um, and. Uh, uh, we're really enjoying having seeing all the people out there and, and enjoying the the, uh, the trails and the interpretive signage. Um, we're, we are proposing to uh, to expand the network of trails, uh, as shown on this map, uh, by adding a, a loop that's in blue, which we're calling the Loom Brook Trail, following for quite a distance along Loom Brook. Um, uh, it's quite a quite a lovely uh, trail um, uh, that will would be uh, constructed. Uh, doesn't when I say constructed, it doesn't really require much earth moving or uh, very little of that. Most of the trail actually exists as an animal trail, uh, but they would have to be some footbridges and uh, bog bridges at a few locations where it crosses uh, a number of small swales that come down off the hill. Um, uh, so that would uh, loop in and connect to the Stonewall Loop at the south end and connect to a, an extension of the Champion Oak Tree Trail uh, that would then form a loop that's shown in orange. Um, and so that would create about a two mile loop uh, if someone were to just to walk around that. Um, coming off of that down at the south end, there would be just a short stub it goes down to what was the original mill site uh, that originally they planned to build a mill along uh, Loom Brook uh, for the uh, for grist mill and sawmill. Uh, eventually decided Loom Brook wasn't uh, a large enough stream to support that mill and they moved it, uh, the mill site, to the, what's now the center of Monterey. Uh, but uh, there are some remains or vestiges of what appears to be a, a, an old uh, mill building uh, down there that we wanted to uh, explain. Uh, and then there are a couple of short uh, connector trails, one that would follow roughly the old post road uh, down the hill, uh, as believe it or not, the old post road went right through the property, crossed Loom Brook, and then up the hill across Beartown Road and into what's now Beartown State Forest. Um, so we would like to make a connection there, and then that allows people to do a shorter loop if they want to, or a loop like this, with another connector going from the Champion Oak Tree, uh, pretty much follows an old uh, property line and stone wall uh, going down the hill to make a connection. So there'd be a series of, of several different loops. Um, uh, the trails uh, would be generally about two and a half to three feet wide for walking uh, snowshoeing. Um, uh, a couple of the trails, the Champion Oak Extension Trail follows an existing uh, wooded uh, woods road and old logging road. Um, so that one would be wider, uh, more similar to the Turkey Bush and Royal Hemlock Trail and the uh, McCollum Trail. Um, as I mentioned, some of the small swales would be crossed by either step stones, bog bridges, or in a couple of cases, uh, some foot bridges. Uh, as Heather mentioned earlier, all the trails are open to the public for free year round during daylight hours. And the work is uh, creating the trail is pretty simple. Uh, it mostly any clearing would be uh, just basically saplings and branches, um, no living trees over four inches in diameter. There are some deadfalls, uh, some dead trees that have blown down, which will have to be cut uh, with chainsaws, but uh, we're not. Uh, the way we've routed it, there wouldn't be any, uh, the need to cut any uh, living trees, uh, any large trees. 
Uh, this uh, photograph on, uh, on the screen is a long loom brook, a beautiful little section of little cascade where it comes down over some ledges and, and it's quite, quite beautiful. Um, uh, the next steps, uh, we're pr presently in the process of preparing an application to the Conservation Commission for uh, wetlands approval and also scenic mountains approval. Um, uh, those of you who are uh, direct abutters or in the neighborhood, uh, we sent letters to uh, last fall uh, with our early conceptual plans and uh, uh, many of you I have talked with um, and so far, we've gotten very positive uh, response uh, from the uh, neighbors that were closest to it, some of whom I know are on the uh, uh, Zoom call tonight. Um, uh, we're hoping, expecting that uh, uh, when the permitting is finished, and by the way, the, the permits uh, letters will go out to all the direct abutters um, uh, about the uh, wetlands permitting uh, applications and the public hearing process. Uh, certainly your, your uh, uh, input is, is welcomed and, and uh, but uh, uh, so you will, there will be other opportunities to comment, but we're hoping that if you have any comments, uh, we'll hear them tonight. Um, uh, we think that the work will begin probably in May or June and be completed this summer or early fall. Uh, and it's being, will be constructed by the uh, Greenagers group, um, which are teenagers who work in the summertime doing uh, conservation and trail building projects. Uh, and it's being paid for by a, uh, a grant from the state from the Mass Trails uh, uh, program. Um, so at this point, we'll open it up for any comments or questions that you may have. Yes, yeah, so far nothing in the chat. Um, I know, thank you, Tom, for answering the one question about what trees would be replacing the ash. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like we don't have any hands raised. So yeah, so I guess just to clarify, the, the question was what, um, what trees will replace the ash? Um, a lot of it depends on how big of an opening is that they're able to create if they're just taking an individual ash tree in a relatively dense canopy surrounded by other species, it's, it's actually not likely to have much trees uh, grow into that space because there won't be enough sunlight before the canopy itself uh, closes back up uh, in short order. But it's potential, uh, I'd say, likely that, um, you know, a beech, sugar maple, red maple, um, the birches, including black, yellow, possibly paper, uh, would be likely candidates uh, for, you know, seedling uh, germination. If you get some larger openings, um, you might be getting uh, red oak, uh, black cherry, white pine would be my uh, guess. But a lot of it will actually, I should have deferred that question to Peter and Adam because, you know, they'll be, um, they'll be uh, making decisions on the trees and I think they'll have uh, a better uh, guess of you know what trees will be replacing the ash. So I can I'm not sure if Peter or Adam have anything to add to that. No, that in in general that's just the way it works. And Tom is spot on with all those species uh, suggestions. The uh, if there are beech trees in the understory, and beech is very tolerant of the shade. If they're there they will persist and they'll grow, particularly un unless you open up a large area and let the sun pour in. And then some of those light loving, sun loving trees uh, may overtake the beach in certain spots. The, the birches, as Tom mentioned, the birches, um, even the, the maples and, and sugar maple is quite shade tolerant, but it actually does better when it has a good dose of sunlight in terms of its growth. Uh, so yes, those, all of those very common and, uh, and native uh, tree species are apt to come in in different proportions based uh, somewhat relative to what size of a gap in the canopy and how much sunlight reaches the ground. Great. I did want to mention you, uh, that we also, if there were any uh, habitat related questions, we, we also are, are, are uh, 
are uh, lucky to have in our in our listening audience, uh, Marianne Pichet. Uh, Marianne is a, a habitat biologist for mass wildlife. She has visited Bidwell House on on a number of occasions, um, both looking at habitat uh, possibilities and, and looking uh, for uh, evidence of New England cottontail rabbit because uh, Marianne is very much involved with that program. So, um, so she's familiar with the property uh, firsthand and, uh, and is a great source if anybody has a habitat or, or a wildlife related question, uh, particularly as it pertains to Bidwell. She would definitely articulate the whole bird habitat concept that I tried to fumble through uh, much, much more eloquently than I did. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mary. Well, I thought you did a great job with that and also answering the woodpecker question. So <laughs> the only thing I might add is a lot of the forested swamps in the area provide food sources for woodpeckers and dead trees for them to feed on. But yeah. So um, yeah, thanks, Peter, for that, that introduction. I have been working uh, quite extensively in the area of Monterey and the surrounding towns. Um, for the past 10 years on um, New England cottontail conservation and had involvement in uh, many of the projects that Peter mentioned earlier that have been conducted on private land. And my role like Tom's as uh, a state employee and a habitat biologist with the state is to um, work primarily with private landowners who have an interest in managing their properties. Um, so I, um, Happy to be here, happy to be included and uh, participate and answer any question, specific questions people might have and um, uh, extend an offer to if someone has property they're interested in managing and in, uh, in speaking with them about that as well. So thanks Heather for inviting me. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, but yeah, everybody just take note. Um, my email address is here on the bottom of the slide, bidwellhouse at gmail.com. You can email me, ask me questions or email me and say, I have a question for Peter or Marianne or Rob or Tom and I'd be happy to put you in touch. Um, but yeah, and there's also the um, page on our website now with forestry information and hopefully we'll be putting the recording of this up on that site as well. And you can also read our forest stewardship plan. Um, the PDF is up on that page so you can actually read through um, that as well but um and heather are you gonna are you gonna share a link to the story map um, yes i am i'm gonna get that up yeah I'm, I'm hoping to get that up on this i'm actually okay. meeting with our web guy this week to talk about a couple projects so yeah i'm gonna get that cool. up soon. Yep. yeah i think that'll be neat to get uh, more eyes on that because really anywhere in massachusetts you can you can go to that location that story map and find a location near you to to kind of actually put your eyes on projects that have happened on the ground so that you know you can you can actually get a better sense of you know a lot of what we're talking about and it's a beautifully done site too so yeah i definitely want to get the link up for that so great thanks all right well i don't know if anyone has anything else but um like i said send an email to me and i will either answer it or put you in touch with someone who can um but yeah thank you everyone for attending this was great Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good Thank to see you. everybody. Bye-bye. Good to Good see you. all. Stay healthy. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.